Following a period of immense conquest during the Age of Discovery, the Castilians are facing the harsh reality that there is in fact a section of Europe which is not happy with the new superpower forming under their noses. Although most of Italy agreed to join Castile's empire, and the Holy Roman princes accepted that as a consequence of their inability to keep the peninsula themselves, it was Austria that would be the straw to break the camel's back. For perhaps less subtle reasons, the French were also upset. Imagine good King René's corpse being paraded about as justification for this supposedly Provençal state to hold legitimacy, alongside its western Gascon counterpart. Gastian propaganda would have you believe that the Gascons were to be treated as equivalent to Catalans on account of their linguistic relationship, but anyone with a brain knew the Gascons were just an excuse for Castile to claim further territory. They'd be annexed like the Italians one day too. For now, Castile's monarch is looking almost universal, but their work isn't done. It's a time of great religious turmoil, and this Spanish kingdom's role as the most Catholic monarchy will either be left as a titular title of the past, or invoked as justification to put down the heretics in Germany. Either way, the first issue on the agenda is the coalition, and ideas are ready to expand next. There's England, Tunis, France, and even for a cocky enough king, the Holy Roman Empire itself. But each of them comes with their own difficulties. The English are, for now, a neutral party with regard to Castile's expansion. They have neither allied with nor opposed Iberia's expansion. Invading them would put yet another great power into the coalition, and it may even anger regional powers like Denmark. Tunis is allied to the superpower of the Eastern Mediterranean, the Ottomans, whose military strength might embolden the coalition should it come to clash with the Tertios. France itself is already in the coalition alongside the Empire and Hungary, making them a difficult opponent to justify invading. Although it would be possible, the victory could be too Pyrrhic to justify. Finally, the Empire itself is probably a bad idea. Even the Commonwealth allies of Castile might not take kindly to blatant conquest within the Empire after having seized Austria's crown. Let's see where the kingdom goes. Perhaps the answer to the conquest conundrum was simply to not engage. The regent of the kingdom, Francesco, knew one thing above all. If a war with the coalition broke out, most of the fighting would happen in Italy. Acting in his own people's interests, he would avoid war at any cost. Unfortunately for the Italians, Francesco would only be regent for another four years, so peace would only be guaranteed for at most four years. Instead, the reputable diplomats of the most Catholic kingdom would reach out to the minor states of the lowlands and expand Castile's reach around its ally of Burgundy. Although the Burgundians don't see it yet, they will soon have a rude awakening at the hands of a greedy Castile, and if the acquisition of territory in the lowlands isn't a hint, I don't know what would be. Alongside that, the client state of Provence was getting a bit old-fashioned, so work on integrating them into the greater empire began, with Gascony next. In the meantime, Burgundy went to war with France, calling us in to help. One thing to keep in mind is that although France is in the coalition, they're not in a coalition against Burgundy. This means France and Castile are once again at war, but without the Empire's support on account of it being a Burgundian war. No matter how this war goes, there will be a new truce between the French and Spanish, kicking them out of the coalition and perhaps weakening them enough to disband, in theory. There was one piece of political maneuvering done in the French war. After taking Paris, the French were expecting a harsh treaty from their occupiers. But instead, Castile exited the war separately from Burgundy, asking only for one thing, that the old alliance be annulled. The idea behind this was to look good to the English, and to further isolate the French from even the farthest flung corners of their influence. Although Scotland wasn't a particular threat, allowing England to complete its conquest of the Isles and removing one of France's only friends was only beneficial to Castile's interests. After the war, the armies returned to exercising, and Provence's annexation was complete. The fledgling state's purpose had run out, and now a land connection between Toledo and Italy was complete. At the same time, the Pope requested that Castile give up the island of Malta for the Knights Hospitaller. Although the Pope was well respected by the Castilians, this ask was too much. Malta was Spanish, and it would remain that way. The Knights were to be replaced by Iberian orders like the Jesuit, who had been gaining influence across Iberia and the New World. Meanwhile, in Germany, the Protestant Reformation was marching along, and with that meant very few actual imperial candidates. Nominally, the Holy Roman Empire was considered an enemy of the crown. At least they were enemies, until the Reichskron found itself atop Enrique's head one day without him even realizing he was a nominee. Stepping out of the RP perspective for a second, this took me by huge surprise. I wasn't even checking who was getting elected, but I guess so many princes were Protestant that there were no strong candidates. Without Austria to soak up votes, the electors, despite being in a coalition against me, elected me as emperor. This was certainly a strange development, but a welcome one. Being the emperor wasn't something of particular interest to the Castilians, who would rather just see the empire not exist, but nonetheless, it's an honor that one cannot simply refuse. One of the immediate benefits of being the emperor was that now, in theory, Castile could go to war with any of the princes without the emperor's protection, given that, well, they are the emperor. The other benefit was even more diplomatic reputation on account of the title of King of the Romans itself. I'm now at 12 diplomatic reputation, giving 36 more reasons for vassalization flat. That's pretty good. 
The real question here is if we could even call it a political maneuver to be elected to a throne you neither were vying for nor you even wanted to have. What I wonder is why the Empire didn't elect Burgundy, who is clearly the most powerful prince, but it must have been that they're just lacking the diplomatic reputation to sway the princes passively. Shortly after acquiring the imperial title, Castile also heard news of England declaring its own empire of Britain. At the same time, Burgundy's usefulness as an ally had run its course. Maybe it was hubris, but being the Holy Roman Emperor and the Universal Monarch, did Castile even need alliances anymore? The answer is no. But that no is highly compounded by a Burgundian duke with no heir and a shared family. Although the throne can be claimed now, the war to push the claim will have to wait until the truce is up. Hopefully no heir will appear, although if one does, there may be an avian incident that will change the course of history. Anyway, the hubris creeping into Castile infected its diplomacy with the Brits too. Why should they get to call themselves another empire, when there's only one empire that really matters? The Spanish Armada sailed for London uncontested in its might, and the Tercios landed outside its walls, laying siege. The British armies were too afraid to even try and confront them, letting London fall like cowards. Oh, Naples was there too, cheering along the Spanish soldiers. Britain's only real friend in this war was Friesland, who I'm sure was not happy to be dragged into a clearly losing war. Indeed, being an imperial prince, they'd paid the price for their opposition to the throne. They were set upon by the Austrians and promptly occupied, looted, and partitioned into further fractured lowland states. States which would, almost immediately, swear fealty to the Trastamara dynasty. East Frisia, Utrecht, and Munster were established and promptly subjugated, leaving poor Friesland devastated. Britain was then promptly annihilated, and plans for a treaty to partition the nation were to be drawn up. There was much debate between the Spanish councils on how to particularly dismantle Britain. Should the conquest be focused on urban areas like London, York, and Gloucester, effectively trisecting England? Or should they be a little more aesthetically pleasing, albeit less horrifically punishing? Since the war to grab the Burgundian throne wouldn't be on the table for at least two more years, there was lots of time to deliberate Britain's partition. It was indeed decided to trisect Britain, with East Anglia and Wessex being entirely cut off from the Midlands and Cumbria so that Britain's fledgling empire would have its wings clipped before even hatching out of its egg. Although 140 aggressive expansion might sound like a lot, we're at the point in the game now where expansion is more or less free. Particularly once Burgundy's throne has been taken, there will be no actual powers with nearly enough power to withstand Imperial Castile's strength. With that conquest, the informal subjugations of Utrecht and East Frisia were turned formal, as the two nations became vassals, and Castile now had about a year and a half to plan out its invasion of Burgundy. The strategy seemed to be to just rush to Dijon, and basically nothing else. All the Burgundians were often second fiddle to Castile, and in the rising period of Castilian power were perhaps even equals. Their current political position renders Burgundy merely a particularly large ant among the horde of other imperial princes, one that is no harder to stomp than any other. The Pope, who up to now was just grateful that Castile had not been taken by heresy nor by secular desires to conquer Rome, passed away and was replaced by a cardinal loyal to Iberian interests. This meant Castile now had control over basically every institution of Christendom and was about to subjugate its greatest opposition as well. The universal monarchy is finally coming to fruition. Well, I say that, but unfortunately an heir to Burgundy's throne was born and oh hey, is that an American black swift at my window? Wow, what a rare bird here on the west coast. Oh crap, my game crashed. Well, that's unfortunate. At least Burgundy still has no heir. Anyway, the war is on and Burgundy is quite frankly screwed. They have no allies of any military repute and their capital is completely exposed. I'm just going to hire a general who we can give all the glory to for this campaign and my god, is that a six siege general? Ramon, you gigachad. Dijon will fall in mere seconds with a guy like that. Well, it's been maybe six months, and Burgundy's entire home region has already been occupied. The lowlands are next. Since I'm here, I'm also just going to swipe Brabant without anyone noticing. They're allied to Dortmund and Dithmarschen, which I don't think will matter for this war. To be fair to Burgundy, by the way, they are allied to Sweden, but my man Ramon is simply going to bust down Stockholm's walls and force the king to kiss his boot before they even realize they've been sieged. Anyway, with Sweden out of the war, Burgundy is now in a humiliating personal union, and Brabant has been taken for the Castilian crown, as something of an enclave of royal power in the lowlands. For the Spanish Netherlands mission, only to convert it all to Catholicism, but because the Reformation has already started converting the land there, it might take a long time to get it done. I also don't have religious ideas yet. Conveniently, my truce with France has also ended, which means once again, Castile and Burgundy will work together to take down France, but this time Burgundy is participating, perhaps unwillingly. Would Burgundy ever be unwilling to fight France though? Probably not. The French army, conveniently, was just reclaiming Paris as our forces came in, so it looks like things weren't looking so hot for France. I was checking out Burgundy's mission tree to see if I could do the King of Franks mission for them while they're my personal union. Since unions can have vassals, it would be possible to give Burgundy France's vassals, which they handle on their own, but Burgundy never completed the previous mission, so it won't happen. That and France has no vassals anymore since even Orleans broke free. 
In the peace deal with France, I grabbed Maine for myself and then released Brittany and Champagne so I could vassalize them. Looking back, I wouldn't have bothered with Champagne, but Brittany is a good pick because they have exploration ideas. Yet another colonial vassal will mean I can colonize even faster. Despite being unwilling, an imperial issue came to the king's attention with regards to the rising threat of the peasantry of the empire. I was thinking about actually giving concessions to the peasants so everyone in the empire would be a little weaker since I never joined the empire, I wouldn't be affected by it, but I decided to crush the peasants instead since it's just kind of the better choice. Following the acquisition of Burgundy, construction of the level 3 Alhambra was completed and that 5% administrative efficiency is feeling real good to have. In combination with the council consensus bar, Castile could have 10% administrative efficiency without any tech. It's not huge, but it's certainly something. Next up, I'll do El Escorial, but I also want to do the Malta Forts. The big reason behind the Escorial is the governing capacity, since I'm really hitting my cap and I've already built all the courthouses I can. The Escorial also gives bonuses to treasure fleets, so I'm going to try and get some colonies for myself off in Mexico. The question is how to go about that, given that I don't have claims over there. My vassal, Brittany, put a colony over in Miami, which means now my borders are right by the natives of the Caribbean. Why not use all that diplomatic reputation to simply vassalize Mexico? It's an unorthodox strategy for sure, but why not? It's going to waste a lot of diplomatic points, but I'm so far ahead on technology that I'm kind of okay with it. To be clear, it's not a good idea to do this, but I just like the roleplay of this new strangely diplomatic Castile. By the way, pro tip, if you're fighting a nation whose capital is the center of reform, just force convert them and the center of reformation is gone. This is what I did to Orleans. Anyway, back to Mesoamerica. We're going to improve relations and ally all of these natives and eventually annex them to create colonial nations. It was also during this time that the Council of Trent came up, and although I'm kind of playing religious Castile, I chose conciliation, and in my mind logic goes that heretics can be forgiven by the merciful Castilian king, and therefore, heretics ought to be looked upon kindly. In gameplay mechanic terms, 25% improved relations is way better than the harsh council modifiers. I kept on increasing trust, improving relations, and allying native nations, and then I saw that Oirat got the unguarded nomadic frontier disaster. I can't quite see China yet, but this could be a game with Qing in it if the Manchu were going to take Beijing. Being a good Christian kingdom, I also forcefully converted all my new native subjects. It's also time to go to war with Britain again to take the rest of England. With how weak Britain is now after losing most of their land, the war went without any issues. Aachen was also in the war, and as punishment for them joining the war, I annexed them. After the war, Denmark lost enough land that I could vassalize them. Just a little bit of trust, or I can wait for my cores to complete so I can get my diplomatic reputation back, and then with Denmark, I can get a bunch of cores off of Sweden. I then annex Switzerland and Naples to save myself some diplo slots. Another war with France incoming. The French after this war have been reduced to a little section of Normandy. I annexed Brittany and Champagne followed my first native vassal. Ichisi, together with Breton Miami, formed Florida, whose culture was Breton thanks to that one Breton colony. Kinda funny, but I always enjoy a mix of cultures in the new world for roleplay purposes. Next vassal is Scotland, who may end up colonizing a little bit for me if I get lucky. The more colonial vassals I can get, the faster my colonial empire will expand even without my own ability to colonize outside of my one national idea colonist. Denmark managed to colonize enough of Colombia for me to get the Spanish main mission, which gives me claims to parts of Central and South America. These newfound claims, I'm just going to give up on the diplomatic solution for the natives. It's wartime. Being technologically outdated natives, I can send just a token force and wipe the floor with the Mesoamericans. Unfortunately, when I integrated my vassals in the Yucatan Peninsula, it created a colonial subject whose capital is not in the Mexico region. That means I can never complete the Viceroyalty of New Spain mission. That mission requires a subject in Mexico, which means a subject whose capital is in Mexico. The only way to make it happen now would be to release Mexico as an independent nation, then to reinvade, ensuring the first five provinces I take are in the Mexico region. I also embraced the printing press and got religious ideas at this point, which I'm going to use to rapidly convert the land of my colonies and the land of the Netherlands, so I can take the Spanish Netherlands mission later. Time for another Britain war, another one of many to come. At this point, I'm just going to annex every ally that Britain gets on principle. Assuming they're small enough to annex as a non co belligerent, I will take every province I can, which in this case means Hamburg, Oldenburg, and Bremen. I could go after Brunswick and Brandenburg, but again, my unfortunate passivity, as I mentioned in the first part, got the better of me. I have nothing to fear, and I will learn that lesson soon in upcoming wars. We'll see. With the annexation of Friesland, the last of the lowlands, not under my control, has been conquered. Against Britain itself, I'm going to return all the Scottish cores and take a little bit of Wales and Ireland. Britain is now relegated to Ireland itself. It was shortly after annexing that huge section of Britain that the religious leagues were founded, and this is going to be interesting. Although I believe that the League would never attack me because how strong I am, I kind of wanted them to. It can be tough to bait an AI into fighting you, since they tend to be very passive about declaring wars. It's rare to ever have war declared on you in this game, but it can happen. 
I had a plan to trigger the League Wars. First of all, raise a Tertheos, which I had completely ignored this whole time despite talking about them last video. I don't know why, but I just kind of forgot about them. Tertheos take 30% less shock damage, so they are hardier than other units, and with later mission they also get further modifiers. I'm going to raise those Tertheos and drill them for a while in preparation for the League War. My plan is to bait the League into attacking me by attacking the Ottomans. The AI will account for who you're at war with when deciding if you're vulnerable or not. I'm hoping that the AI will think I'm vulnerable if I'm at war with the Ottomans, at which point I'll just peace out the Ottomans when the League declares to put my full forces on the League. While preparing for that, the Commonwealth called me in against Russia, who was allied to Britain, so yet another war with Britain, it seems, is on the table. I start peace with Russia to nullify their alliance with Britain so I can go to war with Britain again in the near future. To shake things up a bit, I even attacked France at this point, who is out of Hungary. I'm going to vassalize France since they'll be colonizing for me too. I fed some land to Austria from Hungary as recompense for their inconveniencing me, and then vassalized France. I completed religious ideas, and I want to take some of the policies they give me, and then I finally put forward my Golden Age, allowing me to complete a very important mission. Fecho del Imperio. To get the Capstone mission Universal Monarchy, I'm going to have to convert the Netherlands and get my professionalism up for the Tertheos mission. I've been collecting trade in the English Channel, and now my income is skyrocketing. I'm collecting from basically every strong trade node in the game. Speaking of the English Channel, it's time to beat up Britain again. I know this section is about the League Wars, and trust me, we'll get there, but there's just some menial labor we've got to get through before we can fight the League. I've left the British stuck in Western Ireland now, and I'm planning to vassalize them too, soon, if I can get their war score cost low enough. Unfortunately, because of Britain's continuous colonizing, they just get larger and larger, so I'll have to time my conquests right. I might even truce break later on to simplify the process at some point. Anyway, the big moment is coming. My Tertheos are fully drilled, and I'm feeling ready for the Ottomans and the League. I'm going to attack Tunis and co-belligerent the Ottomans. I'm doing this so the AI will be more willing to declare war on me, and with some luck, Brandenburg will come at me. With my willing ally, the Commonwealth, I expect both the Ottomans and the Protestant League to fall apart. Fighting Tunis and the Ottomans felt a little scary, but it looks like the Ottomans had their army somewhere in the east, and I was able to completely overwhelm the Balkans and even cross into Anatolia. Next to Brandenburg's malevolent personality, they actually let me know they'd be declaring war preemptively, which was a relief because I wasn't actually certain my idea would work. I wanted the League War to trigger because I had a plan for those filthy Protestants. With the war declared, basically every nation in Europe is at war, with only a couple princes staying neutral in the League War. Shortly after the League, my Emperor died, and the new Emperor was re-elected, most likely on account of there just not really being any other options to elect, now that the vast majority of the Empire is Protestant. So let's talk about the plan for the Protestant League. I'm going to separate peace, every single prince, and take as much land as I can. So I'm the defender in this war as the Emperor, every attacker is a co-belligerent for the purpose of war score cost. That means I could potentially fully annex almost the entire empire and all it'll cost is a ton of diplomatic points for unjustified demands. I'll also have to hit some kind of insane overextension numbers, but I'm doing this because I must defeat my passivity. I have an opportunity to take the empire and I will not pass it up. First up was Prague. The capital fell, but peace was a while away since all participants in the war get an extra 50 reasons to stay in the war thanks to the religious war cost his belly. I got an heir via the Starlight event as well, and it's a woman, who I named Elizabeth. I'm not sure why the name is English, since Elizabeth would be Isabella in Spanish, but that's fine. The only problem is, I can't get elected as Emperor if I have a female heir. Anyway, I ended the war with Tunis, taking his entire coastline. No more Barbary pirates to deal with. I'll get the rest of the land later. When it comes to peace with Bohemia, I actually let them off the hook because I wanted their army out of the war. Looking back, I should have just fully occupied them how I'm going with everyone else in the war, but that's in the past now. A slight mistake is fine. I'd compensate on this war more, but to be frank, it's kind of a hellish mess of friends and foes handling everything while I park my armies on tiny enemy capital forts. I mean, look at this, what do I say? This is the AI's war, I'm just reaping the rewards. The first big annexation I did in the war was Saxony. They were too big to fully annex, but I got almost everything they had. That's a lot of overextension, but important note here, my allies will track and destroy rebels in my country since allies in wars go after any hostile armies, including rebels. I'm overextended, but I've definitely got things under control. Next is Landshut, who I could have waited to full annex, but I was lazy. Britain I simply white pieced so I could have a shorter truce. I gave Lubeck to Denmark since I figured the Danes would want control of their Lubecker rivals. Unfortunately, the Emperor passed away during the war while having a female heir, so I did not inherit the Empire again, leaving the Imperial throne in the hands of none other than Donauwerth. Yeah, I guess they're one of the few Catholic monarchies in the Empire left. Anyway, Lewenberg is next. They're being split between me and Verden. I then declared war on the new emperor so I can annex him too and whatever allies he calls in. I might as well just end the empire at this point instead of doing so through the League War in a way. This is now a very confusing League War with, with the former emperor fighting both the Protestant League and the new emperor while also maintaining the Catholic status quo of the empire with the intention of eradicating the empire. I annexed the rest of the little princes and all that was left was Cleves and Brandenburg alongside the handful of neutral and Catholic princes. 
I ended the war, splitting Brandenburg with the Commonwealth, Magdeburg, Sweden, and myself. I of course took Berlin. Funnily enough, this concluded the war with religious peace since I didn't bother enforcing Catholicism as the Empire's religion. I couldn't do so anyway since if you're not the Emperor, that peace option isn't in the list anymore. At the end of the war with the new Emperor, I had 233% overextension and not enough admin points to core at all, so we're going to be putting down rebels for a bit. I might be overextended, but that doesn't mean Britain can escape my wrath. Unfortunately for me, they've expanded down in Africa, so I'm going to spend another war taking their overseas territory, and hopefully next war I can vassalize them. Throughout the duration of the war, I was able to get all my cores done and weapon storm overextension without any real issues. The only issue that happened was that global trade triggered while I was overextended. When overextended, your trade power was reduced, which meant I couldn't steer as much trade as Sevilla or the English Channel. That made Constantinople the highest trade value node in the world, allowing the Ottomans to spawn the institution instead of me. I can live with that though. With that aside, this is the Holy Roman Empire in 1607. The Age of Absolutism is on the horizon and the Empire is composed of Magdeburg, Bohemia, Volgas, Dithmarschen, and a couple other minor states, with Augsburg leading them. The other princes are just Castilian subjects. To get my most important mission, I have to dismantle the Empire and convert the Netherlands, but that'll have to wait until the Age of Absolutism. I'm excited to get this mission so I can start tag switching into a bunch of other mission trees and stack even more modifiers. With the Age of Absolutism coming, it's time to develop some crown land, so I'm going to stack up develop modifiers over in England and put the Jesuits in there. The Jesuits reduce development costs and provide development themselves. I'm going to put down development edicts and throw about 2,000 points into developing England. Thanks to this, I'll jump from about 30% crown land up to 60%. Thanks to the system of council's reform, I can even revoke my estate privileges without needing any loyalty. But I'll wait until we actually get to the next age to revoke them. I'm feeling great going to the next era, with a massive income and unfettered power in Europe. Once I dismantle the Ottomans, there will be no one left to challenge me. I'll likely have to betray the Commonwealth sometime soon, but I've got their loyalty for now. Capping the Age of Reformation off with the disastrous Protestant League, Christianity is solidly Catholic, with Protestants and Reform soon to be converted away by Castilian Inquisitors. The Empire is completely in shambles and Europe is effectively unified under Castile. The last bastions of non-Castilian control are Sweden, Hungary, Bohemia, and to some extent the Commonwealth. They'll fall during the Age of Absolutism for sure though. Part of Castile's entry into this new age was to immediately strip the lesser estates of their rights and centralize power into the monarchy's hands. Here's the current Empire, and it will only expand from there. Castile's power is far from plateauing, but the very identity of the Castilians may go through a massive upheaval in the near future, with differing regions of the Empire becoming more and more important to the identity of the Empire. In particular, England, having been massively developed using the loot and economic stimulus of the League War, may become a new hub of Castilian power. The colonies have been on the back burner, but Portugal remains mostly in control of that aspect of Castile's empire. The more tempting place to conquer is looking like India or China and their immense riches. Come back next time for the Age of Absolutism, where expansion gets even faster on account of the massive administration efficiency available to absolutist monarchs. That's all for now. Thank you for your time.